So you, did anyone in the family, there have got to be other mafia-connected relatives. When you said, I wanted to be a cop, didn't anyone take you aside and say, you didn't inherit that mantle? I'm oh, sure. They've all told me you're crazy. What well, do you know? What do you want to do that for? And you became a cop, and you're too modest to say... In 1992, a retired New York police detective by the name of Louis Epolito appeared on the Sally Jesse Raphael show to tell the story of how he'd gone into the force despite coming from a family of mobsters, his own father being a member of the Mafia's Gambino family. Epolito said he tried to do his best, but the stigma of his family's violent background, which he touched on for Raphael's audience, led to what he described as a smear campaign by the NYPD, which drove him out after a 21-year career where he became the 10th most decorated officer in the force's history. Epolito was reserved for most of the interview, perhaps even a little nervous, but he gradually loosened up and graced the audience with tales of his approach to law enforcement, including this one. Again, I was a very tough guy. I call the guy up to lock him up. He tells me uh, he's gonna kill my mother. He's gonna peel the skin off her back. Lovely. Right. I go down and I put a shotgun in his mouth in a club that's owned by Spiro in Brooklyn, big wise guy. You put a, you would open someone's mouth and put a shotgun I in I stuck it down his mouth. He did. And I. He did. I cocked the gun barrel and he wet himself. He was, his stain was getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> Gee, I can't imagine why. Um, it was a story he'd included in an autobiography he'd come on the show to promote, Mafia Cop. The story of an honest cop whose family was the mob. But that's not the book we're discussing today. Two years after Mafia Cop's publication, Anthony Gaspipe Casso, the underboss of the Lucchese family, followed the example of three subordinates he'd tried to kill and turned state's evidence to avoid a probable life sentence for murder and racketeering. And he gave the shocking news that he had two cops on his payroll, Louis Epolito and his friend and early police partner, Major Case Squad Detective Steve Caracapa. Not only had they identified informants that Caso subsequently eliminated, they had personally carried out a hit on mobster Eddie Lino for him. Jerry Capisi, writing for the New York Daily News, publicly named the two as suspects. Epolito and Caracapa lawyered up, and nothing happened. Caso ruined his cooperation deal by trying to discredit other witnesses with stories that fell flat and continued crimes in custody. But his story of what would be known as the Mafia Cops case seemed credible, and there was still one witness who could testify against them. Caso hadn't worked with the cops directly. An associate named Burton Kaplan was the one who'd first used their services, and he acted as a middleman when Caso needed their help. Kaplan was convicted of trafficking marijuana in 1997, and seven years later, investigators digging deep to revive the cold case finally persuaded him to talk. Retired in Las Vegas, Epolito continued small-scale crimes of opportunity, allowing the government to catch him and Caracapa in a sting operation for money laundering and drug trafficking. This was critical, as it brought the cops' criminal history into the RICO Act's statute of limitations, allowing the U.S. Department of Justice to prosecute them for everything they'd done. The case came to trial in 2006, with Kaplan as the star witness. He talked about how he'd first been referred to the cops by Epolito's mobster cousin to dispose of Israel Greenwald, a potential witness in a rumbled treasury bill theft. Kaplan explained how he'd conspired with the cops to have Greenwald abducted and killed and the terrified owner of the garage Greenwald was buried in after his murder, finished the story. Caso first used the cops to get the names of three gunmen who targeted him in 1986, 
Kaplan recalled forwarding the name of one perp the NYPD had identified, Jimmy Heidel, and his mother, Betty Heidel, took the stand to recall seeing two cops resembling the defendants, suspiciously surveilling the neighborhood, a memory refreshed by Eppolito's Sally appearance. Later that day, they picked up Jimmy Heidel under the pretense of an arrest, then delivered him to Casso for interrogation and execution. Casso's quest for revenge was one of his motives for having the cops kill Eddie Lino, who Heidel said was one of the mobsters who ordered the hit. But before that, he went looking for the other trigger men, entered into evidence were records of police database searches by Caracapa for perp Nicky Guido. But Kaplan testified that Caso didn't want to pay the cops' fee to verify in ID. In the end, Caso went looking for Guido himself and ended up putting out a hit on an innocent civilian of the same name. Eppolito and Caracapa were convicted on all charges dying in prison after exhausting their appeals. Eppolito and Caracapa's crimes were called the worst corruption case in the NYPD's history, and the press attention led to book deals for two of the investigators, William Oldham and Tommy Dades, before the trial even began. Oldham, another member of Major Case, got his book out first. The Brotherhoods, the true story of two cops who murdered for the Mafia came out as early as 2006. Tommy Dades, with the NYPD's intelligence division, teamed up with a New York assistant district attorney he'd worked with, Mike Vecchione, to help write 2009's Friends of the Family, the inside story of the Mafia Cops case. Besides the subject matter, the Brotherhoods and Friends of the Family have a few similarities. The cops credited on the covers brought in co-authors to fill the pages and complement their own stories. Oldham's book was the first one written by journalist Guy Lawson, while Dades and Vecchione had the more experienced David Fisher in their team. Both tell the story in the order the facts came out, rather than a strict chronological order. The titles of both books have double meanings. The Brotherhoods can refer to either the NYPD or the Mafia, while Friends of the Family describes both Eppolito and Caracapa's status in regards to the Lucchese crime family, as well as Tommy Dade's friendship with Betty Heidel which drew him into the investigation of Jimmy Heidel's death. Adaptations of both books have been announced, with neither entering production at time of writing. Finally, the authors of both books have chips on their shoulders when it comes to who got credit for making the case. My list of differences is shorter, only two, but more significant. First, Friends of the Family is a mere 264 pages in hardcover, while The Brotherhoods is almost twice as long. Second, and tying into the first, Friends of the Family is the story of Dades' involvement in the investigation. The Brotherhoods is the story, that is to say, the full story. The first two chapters of The Brotherhoods serve to introduce the reader to William Oldham and the NYPD as he knew it. He doesn't paint the rosiest picture of the department, and passages acknowledging a casual tolerance of low-level corruption and brutality haven't aged well, though the latter is somewhat mitigated by the first chapter opening with a story of Oldham facing off with equally ruthless cop impersonators who would resort to torture and murder when ripping off drug dealers. Oldham himself, while generally a good cop, admits to just enough to come off as credible to readers. Oldham's first major case with Major Case was the 1989 kidnapping of 12-year-old Donnell Porter, the brother of a major crack dealer. The investigation was a dismal failure. 
Donnell Porter turned up dead, and the perp, Kingpin Clarence Preacher Heatley, remained at large until 1996. The case makes two contributions to the story. First, discussion of Heatley's dirty cop enforcer John Cuff. Let's hold him talk about how the NYPD's internal affairs profile for bad cops was based on sudden changes of behavior, leaving them with a blind spot for cops who were corrupt from the day they entered the force. Second, the lead detective on the case was none other than Steve Caracapa, and Oldham considered his lack of urgency and possessiveness of the case a masterclass of how not to solve a kidnapping. Caracapa's coldness to Porter's plight is also a rare insight into his character. Of the Brotherhood's two main antagonists, he is by far the more discreet. Lou Eppolito gets an entire biographical chapter, as do Anthony Caso and Bert Kaplan. Oldham does a service for readers by fact-checking the more outlandish stories in Mafia Cop, as well as relaying the accusations of misconduct Eppolito left out of his autobiography, and the culture of self-aggrandizement in the NYPD that makes his decorations less impressive than they seem. These biographical chapters give a good understanding of the key players, and Lawson and Oldham give their readers all the information they need to understand Eppolito and Caracapa's work with the Mafia. As mentioned, however, this information is relayed in the order Oldham learned of it. The end result is a somewhat convoluted narrative that may confuse readers. Here is an outline of the first half of The Brotherhoods. After William Oldham is introduced, the next two chapters chronicle the undermining of intelligence on the Lucchese family, mostly through the deaths of informants, and the survival of murder targets turned cooperators Pete Chiodo and Al Diarco confirmed to police and the FBI that the family's homicidal maniac of an underboss, Anthony Caso, had a mole in law enforcement. We then have a brief detour where Oldham works with federal prosecutors to make his first RICO case against Vietnamese street gang Born to Kill. As Oldham notes in his critique of Mafia Cop, a police officer who writes an autobiography ought to include their best case, and BTK makes a nice bonus for his book. After the still largely one-sided biography of Louis Eppolito, we get the life of Anthony Caso, from his childhood to his final arrest in 1993. Once he learns he can't bust out of jail, he cooperates, and the story of his rise is told again, with the narrow focus of how help from Burton Kaplan's friends kept him at the top of his game. This chapter ends with Kaplan's efforts to keep the cops' names to himself, undone by the publication of Mafia Cop. Finally, the word gets out that Caso has flipped. Kaplan goes on the lam, and we get his biography, starting with how gambling debts turned a capable legitimate businessman into an equally capable mob fence and drug trafficker. He meets Eppolito's cousin, Frank Santora, during a prison stretch. Santora refers Kaplan to the cops. And by the end of the following chapter, when Caso's deal has fallen through and Kaplan gets arrested for his marijuana deals, readers will have been presented the full story. After the FBI failed to flip Kaplan in 1997, they essentially dropped their investigation and Oldham spends the next few years, among other things, trying to dig up clues to make a case, even after retiring from the NYPD in 2001. This is easily the most tedious part of the Mafia Cop saga, and I normally skip over this section when rereading The Brotherhoods, but in that book, it's only a handful of chapters in the middle. 
Dades and Vecchione's Friends of the Family, by contrast, is set almost entirely in this period, and at times it feels as though the backstory of the conspiracy is only being given on a need-to-know basis. Tommy Dades begins his story in 2003 with Betty Heidel recalling her encounter with the cops the day her son disappeared, sparking Dade's interest in the case, and prompting him to refer to Brooklyn ADA Mike Vecchione. In The Brotherhoods, Oldham takes note of Dade's enthusiasm for the case, in spite of his unfamiliarity with it, and his lead from Betty Heidel was described as a golden nugget. In Friends of the Family, while Oldham is credited with providing his files on the cops to the team Dades is assembling, he's reduced to a bit player. Oldham describes himself as a loose cannon in the Brotherhoods, but the things Tommy Dades admits to in his book left me taken aback. While Oldham starts his book with a near-death experience, when one of the phony cops he's pursuing points a jammed gun at him, Friends of the Family's first chapter sees Dade storm a wedding rehearsal to arrest a mobster and shout death threats at the guests while subduing the arrestee. Oldham admits to failing to Mirandize a drug dealer he arrests and lying under oath about it. This is probably Oldham's most alarming admission, but the only consequences are that he can't stop the dealer from being prosecuted for an armed robbery charge he thinks stemmed from a mistaken ID. Dades, on the other hand, admits in his book he jeopardized an assault prosecution by having an affair with the victim, the defendant's girlfriend, which was complicated further when said defendant forced her to accuse Dades of raping her even after the girlfriend told investigators the accusation was made under duress. The heat from the subsequent internal affairs investigation drove Dades to retire at the earliest opportunity. And then, there's what Friends of the Family leaves out. In December 2006, after his retirement, Dades got into a fight with another ex-cop, which ended with the death of a friend who tried to intervene. Somehow, both combatants avoided charges. At least no one appears to have been seriously hurt during William Oldham's drunken post-retirement antics. One of the points of contention for the credit in making the case was the discovery of one of Caracapa's Nicky Guido searches, where he found the address of the wrong Nicky Guido shortly before his murder. Unearthing this was something Dage treated as his own accomplishment, but Oldham points out these records were from files he provided and claims to have known about the search all along. In Friends of the Family, discussion of this evidence leads into questions of what kind of prosecution would be used against the cops. Vecchione, a New York State prosecutor, wants to do individual murder cases. But at the same time, Oldham introduces a federal ADA, Robert Hennock, into the mix. This is treated by Dades and Vecchione as the beginning of the federal government stealing the case they were building. And in the end, Hennock does lead the RICO prosecution against the cops. Oldham flatly admits in his book he was hell-bent on making a RICO case against Epilito and Caracapa with Hennock, even if their known crimes were already outside the statute of limitations. Ironically, Dades indirectly credits himself with making this possible by getting the DEA to launch the Vegas investigation. Of course, no prosecution, federal or state, would have been possible without a solid cooperating witness. While the books disagree on who said the magic words in negotiations to get Kaplan to break his silence, all three of our gangbuster authors admit that, without him, they were desperate enough to try to resurrect Anthony Caso's deal. In particular, Vecchione complains about how the feds stonewalled him in any attempt to work with Caso. 
and he seems to buy into Kaso's own narrative that the only reason his deal was revoked was to protect their earlier cases, rather than for his own unreliability. It struck me as strange that friends of the family would spend so much time on this point, when the book also illustrates what kind of witness Kaso would have been. Tommy Dades recalls how Kaso contradicted his reports to the feds in a later interview, and the book includes how he completely changed his story during the 2006 trial, sending the court a letter denying working with the cops at all. After the arrests comes complaints about who got credit. Oldham, fresh off recapping the Vegas sting, briefly talks about how the press gave it all to Tommy Dades, citing 60 Minutes in particular. But he's ready to move on. In the meantime, Mike Vecchione complains about how little his and Dades' team were credited at a press conference announcing the bust, and the two were embittered again when they were blamed for early leaks about the case to the press, severed from it, and had all of their files seized. This is piled onto Vecchione's frustration with losing his chance to try Eppolito and Caracapa for murder, though for a short time he was vindicated. In the pre-trial hearings for the RICO case, the judge, Jack Weinstein, was skeptical of the link between the cops' work for the Mafia and their crimes in Vegas. After the trial, though satisfied Eppolito and Caracapa's guilt was proven, he shocked everyone by declaring the two phases of crimes weren't related, and overturned the verdict under the statute of limitations. As both books point out, that wouldn't have been a problem with the state murder charges Vecchione wanted to pursue. Though, perhaps it was for the better that he didn't get his shot. And not just because Oldham and Henock's Rico gamble ultimately paid off. A year after Friends of the Family was published, a murder conviction Vecchione prosecuted was overturned when it emerged, among other things, that key witnesses had been threatened to secure their testimony and Vecchione retired under a cloud in 2013, when his boss lost re-election and other allegations of misconduct were piled on. Reading the book with this knowledge casts a dark irony on its telling the story of Barry Gibbs, framed for a murder in much the same way by Louis Eppolito. It also raised my curiosity regarding two incidents in 2003, where Vecchione's home was broken into, and someone subsequently planted drugs in his car after conspicuously breaking a window. Particularly, as I've had trouble finding coverage of these incidents outside of books Vecchione wrote himself. And I can't leave Vecchione without bringing up that he was the prosecutor in the unsuccessful 2007 murder case against FBI agent Linda Vecchio that stemmed from his mishandling of informant Gregory Scarpa. And Joseph Bistone slammed him for taking the case in his book, Donnie Brasco, Unfinished Business. The beef didn't extend to the co-author, however, as Bistone and Dade shared a friendly podcast appearance in 2021. Dades, Vecchione, and Fisher waited until the Second Circuit Court of Appeals reinstated the guilty verdict in 2008, before publishing their book, giving their readers a satisfying ending. The Brotherhoods, however, rushed to publish in 2006, when the fate of The Cops was still uncertain. Even worse, the book's final section sees Oldham invited to speak to the Knights of the Round Table, a retired police detectives club, where he receives a chilly reception from cops, foreseeing the case to completion, and locking up their former colleagues Eppolito and Caracapa. It's even more eerie today, and helps build what should be a downer ending. But I never felt that way. And it wasn't just because I knew how the case ended. Immediately before all of this is one of the most cathartic sections of the book. After their convictions, Eppolito and Caracapa fired their lawyers and filed appeals claiming incompetent counsel. 
Eppolito in particular complains that his lawyer, former John Gotti mouthpiece Bruce Cutler, wouldn't let him take the stand as his own defense witness. So, Robert Hennick decided to show what might have happened by asking Eppolito to explain some acts of brutality he described in Mafia Cop, including the incident in the opening clip. And so, I present Louis Eppolito's Finest Hour. I spotted Frankie sitting at a card table, walked up behind him, stuck the barrel in his mouth, and ordered him to his feet. Bye, motherfucker, was all I said, and he lost his whole insides. As I backed him into a wall, I watched the stain in his pants get bigger and bigger. You're not allowed to do that as a cop. Fair to say? That would not be something lawful? Who said I'm not allowed to do that?